Okay, um, it, Amir, if you'll come on up, um, and we'll have the first panelist come up to begin with. Um, is Isaac Bright in the room by any chance? The uh, the third presenter. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll make a game time uh, a play here. So welcome to um, the imaging spotlight this year, which we call New Light on Breast Cancer: Novel Molecular and Functional Imaging Approach to Detect and Characterize Breast Cancer. Um, for me, this is a landmark to have this type of, of topic come to San Antonio and really be focused entirely on molecular and functional imaging. What you'll hear today is in the first few presentations, the first half of the presentations, you'll see some novel and investigational um, probes for looking at particular targets um, in breast cancer, um, and it will be discussed uh, by Farouk Dadashti of WashU and put this in context. In the second half of this, you'll see what are largely um, uh, 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 are all approved methods and agents, uh, but with using these methods to apply to important things, including evaluating response to therapy, uh, screening post-treatment surveillance. And so I'm very excited um, to proceed. Uh, we have a couple of videos from uh, presenters that couldn't make it today. Um, a little difficult for our Chinese participants to make it here, so we'll be presenting by video. Um, and I also want to let you know that Jerry Francoeur, who's our advocate representative, um, had, a, had an issue today and was unable to make it, but uh, we, uh, she sends her regards. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and start with our video presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Zhi Xinhao from Peking Union Medical College Hospital. It's my honor to be here to share our work, accuracy and safety of Bepi Pet City in diagnosis of axillary leaf node metastasis in early breast cancer patients. Here is my disclosure. Traditional imaging, including ultrasound, MRI, and FDG PET, can be used to evaluate the status of ARN non-invasively, but accuracy was still unsatisfactory. Curves make up the bulk of cancer stroma, and the fat is highly expressed in the curves. Fepipat has been found to promote them in breast cancer. In this study, we investigate the accuracy of Fepipat CT, both gallium and fluorine fepi, in newly diagnosed breast cancer patients for assessing ARN metastasis. The safety profile of FAPIPAT CT, and we compared the performance of FAPIPAT CT with that of FDG PET and ultrasound, and we evaluated the accuracy of FAPIPAT before and after biopsy of breast lesions. 130 patients with newly diagnosed breast cancer was enrolled. Patients received FABI and FDG PET CT after enrollment. The time interval between PET CT scan and biopsy was at least one week. On PET CT image, it was defined positive if the radio uptake of ARN was higher than that of the normal tissue. All patients received biopsy or surgery on breast lesion and ARN. The past logical results were used as a gold standard for the diagnosis of leaf node metastasis. 53 patients were finally diagnosed with AR metastasis. The sensitivity, specificity, accuracy of BepiPad were 90.6. <laughs> thank the speaker who I think is listening on. Um, thank you very much. We'll now move on to our next presentation. Just a couple of reminders. We're going to save all of the questions until the end, um, and we'll have a period of between about eight, eight and ten minutes where folks can get up to the microphone and ask questions or send them in by the chat. Um, so to the folks in the back, if we can bring up the next uh, set of slides. Looks like we're still waiting on it. And, and by the way, if, if the presenter for the third um, poster is here, Isaac Bright, um, please, please let us know. Um, 
otherwise we may go past this. Okay, so it, um, I, the next um, presentation is one of my colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania. Sarah Giddle will be talking for uh, poster 05-2, Imaging a PARP Expression as a Biomarker of Response to Chemotherapy in Breast Cancer, a Non-Randomized Clinical Trial from the University of Pennsylvania. Sarah. Hello, good morning everyone and thank you for being here and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to present this research today. Oh, sorry. Uh, 18F fluorothanitrase or FTT is a PET radio imaging agent um, and it has been shown to non-invasively measure PARP binding um, by colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania including Elizabeth McDonald who's here. Um, and. Uh, in breast cancer as well as in ovarian cancer. Um, and most recently, we published our clinical data supporting that FTT um, PET imaging can predict response to PARP inhibitor therapy. Um, Poly-ADP ribose, or PARP, is known to be involved in multiple mechanisms of DNA damage repair. Um, and it, we thought that it could be a unique biomarker to identify tumors that have the propensity for DNA repair capacity. So to evaluate this, we evaluated um, FTT as a biomarker for chemotherapy response in breast cancer. Uh, in a clinical trial, it was a single arm, single center prospective cohort study where women of 18 years of age or older were in, uh, able to be included. They had to have primary breast cancer with a greater than one uh, centimeter lesion, uh, lesion um, and willingness to undergo a PET FTT scan. So here in the schematic here, the, the subjects were enrolled with primary breast cancer, stages one through three. They received an FTT PET CT and then continued on to receive the neoadjuvant chemotherapy regimen, surgical reduction of the mass, and then pathologic complete response um, evaluated by a pathologist as part of clinical care. Um, there were 26 women that were included. One of those had bilateral masses that were pathologically distinct and included. Uh, both lesions were included for a total of 27 lesions. Um, 16 of the subjects had triple negative breast cancer and 11 had 11 lesions were hormone receptor positive and also germline alterations were evaluated for um, genes of interest including HRD genes and we uh, uh, found a few BRCA2 mutants, CHECK2, and ATM. Importantly, none of the subjects received keynote regimen um, or immunotherapy, and all subjects that were included had to have at least, uh, were required to complete at least 75% of the predetermined chemotherapy regimen to be included in the analysis. Uh, the data that we uh, evaluated in the entire cohort together, we saw that FTT uptake was broad across all lesions, and it was not statistically different different in the lesions regardless of the various subtypes, either ERPR, HER2, or triple negative, stages one through three, or those with a genetic mutation of interest, or those without. Um, in the entire cohort, we saw that subjects that had a PCR or pathologic complete response had statistically similar FTT uptake compared to those that did not have a PCR. Um, and then a receiver operating curve analysis, the area under the curve was 6.8. However, when subsetting the subjects to include just triple negative um, breast cancer, those that had a PCR had an increase in FTT uptake compared to those without a PCR with a p-value of 0 0.05. And the area under the curve was increased to 7.9. And here is just some representative imaging of two triple negative breast cancer lesions. The first here on the left had a PCR and had high FTT uptake. This, this subject had a germline BRCA2 mutation with a 3.3 centimeter mass. And here showing um, a subject that did not have a PCR with rather, rather low FTT uptake. And really, uh, based on this data, we are starting to evaluate a threshold that is needed for response, and we are suspecting it could be somewhere around 2 or 2.2 um, for those with triple negative breast cancer to respond or have a PCR. Um, so of interest, there's been a lot of literature that suggests that DNA damage repair has been shown to have potential vulnerability to chemotherapy and triple negative breast cancer. and. Uh, supporting these results, and then in conclusion, FTT PET imaging um, may predict response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in breast cancer, and really 
further studies evaluating this as well as PARP expression as a biomarker for chemotherapy response is warranted. Um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, very nicely done. Um, I also want to point out the posters are all electronically um, uh, loaded on that wall over there. Um, so there will be opportunity at the end of the session to look at them or to refer to them. Um, so I want to ask uh, one more time before we step on, um, is, is Dr. Bright here for the MagSense presentation? Okay, or anybody else who's going to present that for him. So to note to the folks in the back, let's move on to PS05-04. We'll take a couple of, uh, of minutes to move, um, to move forward. Great, starting to make the change. Okay, and our uh, last presenter of the first half of the session uh, will be um, Amir Mansour from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He'll be talking about zirconium-89 uh, trastuzumab PET MRI to characterize her to positive breast cancer, a quantitative approach on tumor heterogeneity. Amir. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. I have no financial relationships to disclose. Okay, so we hypothesized that the integration of zirconium-89 trastuzumab PET with quantitative diffusion-weighted MRI can actually enhance intratumoral heterogeneity characterization in patients with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer. To test this hypothesis, we initiated a phase one clinical trial that is actively recruiting with 13 patients enrolled so far. We set the inclusion criteria to ensure our patient population had pathological confirmed HER2 positive breast cancer, patients were on at least one HER2 targeted agent, and had measurable disease of greater than one centimeter in the longest diameter. <coughs> Following consent, patients were administered with two millicurie of zirconium-89 trastuzumab. Five days post-administration of the tracer, patients were imaged with a PET MRI scanner. This allowed for generation of apparent diffusion coefficient maps, which essentially inform on intratumoral, uh, intratumoral hetero cellular heterogeneity <coughs> and are actually a prognostic marker. We can combine these apparent diffusion coefficient maps with HER2 uh, PET imaging to provide multi-parametric habitat maps. Essentially, these maps inform on the intratumoral these maps allow for uh, generation and identification of subregions that are biologically distinct within the tumor and can allow for evaluation of treatment response or even for follow-up guidance for biopsies. So in characterizing HER2 through imaging, we observed significant uh, uptake compared in brain lesions compared to normal brain, in bone lesions compared to normal bone, and we saw a wide distribution of uptake within soft tissue metastases. It is important to note that um, we did observe high physiological uptake of the antibody tracer in both the liver and the kidneys, which presents a challenge for uh, characterizing tissues that are within these organs. Now, as you can see here with this breast-to-brain metastasis case, um, MRI actually provides excellent contrast, soft tissue contrast to allow for qualitative assessment of both the lesion and its environment. Not only that, it allows us to quant quantitatively assess um, the tumor and its environment. So by looking at the apparent diffusion coefficient and applying thresholds, we're able to uh, essentially identify regions of high and low cellular density. As you can see here, this has identified the enhancing region as high cellularly dense surrounded by low cellularly dense edema. We can also use these subregions to help guide the characterization of the pets since they were taken simultaneously, and so we can further classify any uptake that was not specific to the enhancing region. Lastly, we all know that capturing treatment-induced alterations with a single metric can, of course, be challenging. This is where multi-parametric zirconium-89 trastuzumab PET-MR could enable for a non-invasive evaluation of HER2 expression and intratumoral cellularity. We are currently conducting an assessment of, cor of correlation between the imaging metrics and treatment response kinetics to assess the prognostic capabilities of this modality. With that, I'd like to thank the UAB Cyclotron Facility and the Department of Radiology at UAB for supporting the study. I'd like to thank you all for listening. 
So um, very exciting start to this. I want to remind everybody that in the U.S. at least these agents are all investigational. And now um, to sum up what you've heard in the first half, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Feroz Dadafdi from WashU, who's really been one of the true pioneers in bringing new compounds to breast and other cancers. So Farouk, I think we're pulling your slides up, I hope, um, and um, we have some time for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, further discuss the significance of these imaging biomarkers you just um, heard. So systemic uh, therapy of uh, breast cancer is really based on the biomarkers of tumor tissues that, that is evaluated by in vitro assays. However, even considering that, um, uh, the, uh, these therapies, um, uh, not everyone responds to them, and then they're associated with uh, st uh, st some various degree of toxicity. So the overreaching clinical question is how patient management can be improved. So um, uh, one way is uh, to better individualize therapy with uh, having uh, uh, better tools uh, to evaluate the patient, the tumor behavior, um, improve the staging, and also uh, tools for to assess or predict response to therapy. So the question is, what is the role of imaging biomarkers? Um, uh, can these uh, uh, biomarkers uh, help us better individualize uh, therapy and hopefully have a better outcome? So uh, molecular imaging provides um, uh, various uh, tracers that can evaluate breast cancer, and some of them are specific to breast cancer, like uh, uh, estrogen receptor imaging um, agents. Uh, these molecular imaging biomarkers provide unique information uh, that uh, may be different, um, but uh, often complementary to in vitro assays of tumor tissues. Uh, these uh, biomarkers help us to understand uh, better the tumor behavior in the body in vivo, uh, uh, predict prognosis, uh, also predict uh, uh, the um, response to therapy, and also they provide pharmacodynamic information. So in order to show you how molecular imaging biomarkers uh, can really complement what we know from in vitro assays of tumor tissue, I want to show you two examples. Um, uh, um, considering the two tracers that are approved by FDA and are our clinical uh, use, FDG, which is a glucose analog, and fluoroserodiol, which is an estrogen analog, um, if you look at the top row, uh, it shows you patient uh, with ER positive, HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. Uh, the FDG shows um, uh, some low uptake in the osseous metastatic disease, so telling us that disease is indolent. However, on the right side, the FES shows extensive disease um, in the, uh, in throughout the body and show us that the estrogen receptors are highly expressed, and this is a patient who is likely to, res to um, respond to endocrine therapy. However, on the lower row, uh, similar patient, uh, FDG shows higher uptake in the metastatic disease. However, uh, FES was totally negative, telling us that estrogen receptors are not present to bind uh, to, the, to FES or any other therapies that targeted estrogen receptors. So now let's talk about the um, biomarkers we just heard. Uh, FAPI, which uh, really a fibroblast activation protein, uh, is really evaluated to more microenvironment. It is shown to be complementary to FDG and detect all histological and molecular subtypes of uh, breast cancer. And uh, for example, on the right side, the lower part, uh, a lower um, a, a patient with invasive uh, lobular cancer that FDG is limited in evaluation of it, uh, FAPI can show uh, very nicely the extent of disease um, in the breast and also lymph nodes. It has the potential in assessing response to therapy after new um, um, therapy. And if you label it with a therapeutic radionuclide, then it offers a new way of treating breast cancer. However, we have to be aware of its false positives. Uh, the investigators from China showed us that um, uh, the uh, gallium-68 FAPI uh, performs very similar to um, 
uh, to uh, F18 labeled FAPI in evaluating uh, axillary nodes, and they do both better than FDG and ultrasound. And uh, this study raised an important question, or actually point, that, um, uh, that F18 has a longer half-life, and once this tracer is approved by FDA for clinical use, uh, that offers a wider or broader distribution of this tracer. Then the next uh, tracer you heard about is PARP, um, and uh, uh, PARP uh, is, um, as you know, it's activated in DNA damage uh, for its repair, and uh, if we introduce PARP inhibitors, that several of them are approved in breast cancer, that this process will stop uh, in tumors that have BRCA mutation. FTT has been shown to be to correlate very well uh, with uh, PARP expression, and it is uh, in vivo in patients, uh, there is, uh, uh, the expression is highly variable in various stages of uh, breast cancer, and it is really independent of BRCA mutation. And more importantly, the response to PARP inhibitors has been shown to be uh, required the target, which is uh, PARP expression to be present, and that is a, a way that uh, imaging really can be very helpful in demonstrating that. And you heard uh, um, from investigators in the University of Pennsylvania that uh, the FTT um, is independent of subtype stage and, and presence or absence of gene mutation. And more importantly, um, it could uh, predict uh, uh, complete pathologic response in, ter in triple negative breast cancer um, and that treated with chemotherapy. So this study and other studies uh, raise uh, two questions. Uh, can PARP imaging really help us with selecting uh, patients for chemotherapy? And should the genetic testing be the gold standard of PARP inhibitor therapy? Um, and so the, uh, the next uh, tracer that you heard about is HER2, um, uh, which is a receptor uh, that is a membrane tyrosine uh, kinase. And usually its presence means that the, the tumor is more aggressive. Uh, several nuclear medicine imaging agents have been developed that show that um, uh, they can assess HER2 expression and uh, HER2 expression heterogeneity in the individual patient. For example, I would like to point out um, uh, the image on the upper <coughs> side on the left that if the patient with HER2 positive, uh, ER positive, HER2 negative, uh, that FDG showed multiple lesions uh, throughout the body, and only one of them, uh, surprisingly, was, was uh, positive of zirconium terastuzumab. This case is interesting because it shows you two things. One is uh, the heterogeneity in an individual patient at HER2 expression, and second, HER2 uh, status can change over time, and it's important to assess them um, uh, after they, they require it. And, the, and a study from Dr. Uh, Gebhardt from Netherlands uh, and colleagues uh, used FDG and uh, HER2 targeted therapy, uh, HER2 targeted imaging, and showed that this combination uh, is very um, um, accurate in predicting response to HER2 targeted therapy. And unfortunately, the next uh, presentation wasn't um, here to present, but they, these people um, uh, from the Imaging Bio uh, System Limited, they developed a, a special uh, uh, agent that is uh, used by MRI, and uh, it can not only uh, assess the metastatic um, uh, lymph nodes, but at the same time to evaluate the HER2 status of the lymph node. Um, and then the last uh, we heard uh, from the investigators, University of Alabama, that uh, they showed, um, uh, they used zirconium terastuzan with PETMR. And the interesting part of their presentation was that they could uh, show that intratumoral heterogeneity, which is really a forced prognostic uh, indicator in, in these uh, patients. So the potential impact of these tracers you already heard um, um, is if they're successful, they can improve, for example, FAPI can improve selection of uh, a therapy by better um, uh, staging the patient. Uh, FTT um, uh, maybe can improve uh, selection of the patient for both chemotherapy and PARP uh, inhibitor therapy and be complementary to in vivo assays and genetic testing. 
Um, and uh, the MR agent um, can uh, evaluate uh, HER2 uh, status of the metastatic lesion non-invasively and hopefully in the future may lead to less biopsies and facilitate the uh, start of the therapy. And then zirconium terastuzumab PET-MR showed us the intratumoral heterogeneity, as I mentioned, is a worse prognostic factor and means that these patients may be treated more aggressively. So overall, uh, you can uh, see that there are several potential uh, imaging biomarkers that once they are um, approved by FDA, they can complement in vitro assays, uh, studies of the tumor tissues, and hopefully to improve uh, management of uh, breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Farouk, and the presenters. A very exciting um, session and really, I think, leads to the way of a lot of new things. So we're going we're gonna to try a complicated move because we did identify the missing presenter who unfortunately had his uploads going. So everybody who's up here can, can have a seat. Thank you. You did a great job. Um, we're going to get the next round of presenters to come up. And at the same time, I will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Isaac Bright uh, from um, Imagion Systems in San Diego, who will talk to us about MagSensor 2, a molecularly charged uh, magnetic resonance agent. You're breaking the club of all of us PET imagers. Um, and Dr. Dodowski gave, I think, a very nice intro to this talk in her, uh, in her overview. Um, so we'll finish um, the, the last one, uh, number three, from the first session to orient everybody. And then we'll move very quickly into the second half of our talk and the discussions. Um, so thanks, everybody, for pivoting. And Dr. Bright. Thank you. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I'm Isaac Bright, Managing Director and CEO at Imagion Biosystems. We're public, and some of what I'll talk about is forward-looking statements. The MagSense HER2 imaging agent is a superparamagnetic iron oxide nanoparticle biofunctionalized with trastuzumab to target HER2-positive breast cancer cells. The MagSense HER2 imaging agent is indicated as an adjunct to MRI for the assessment of axillary nodal disease in patients diagnosed with HER2-positive primary breast cancer. This first in human Study of the drug has been completed at four clinical sites in Australia, evaluating safety and preliminary feasibility to detect metastatic disease in HER2-positive breast cancer patients. Participants had a likelihood of lymph node disease uh, in the judgment of the investigators. All participants received a single dose of the drug as a subareolar or peritumoral injection. Baseline MRI assessments were performed within three days before the drug administration. And a second MRI was performed at an additional time point, 18 to 78 hours after the drug administration and before neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The primary objective was to demonstrate the safety and tolerability of the drug as an exploratory endpoint. Um, the study evaluated the potential for MSH2IA molecular MRI to assess if the lymph nodes of the draining the site of HER2 positive primary breast cancer are HER2 positive or HER2 negative. A total of 13 patients were treated under this protocol. Participants were all female and primarily white and not Hispanic or Latino with a mean of age of 57 years. Participants primarily had unilateral invasive ductal carcinoma, clinical stage 2A or 2B. The mean time since diagnosis was 21 days and the mean tumor size was 32 millimeters. The majority of cancers were HER2 positive, ER positive, and PR negative. Safety assessments included incidence and safety, uh, incidence and severity of AEs, incidence of SAEs, clinically significant changes from baseline and laboratory parameters, and injection site reactions. MSH2IA causes changes in the relaxation properties of local tissue being <coughs> imaged, resulting in image contrast on MRI for normal lymph nodes the MSH2IA is taken up by resonant macrophages, resulting in relatively uniform hypo-intense contrast when tumor cells have metastasized to a node because the drug is a molecularly targeted nanoparticle. Specific binding between the target on the METs and the ligand on the drug results in heterogeneous hypo-intensity, and the nanoparticles have become bound to tumor cells in the invaded nodes. The central imaging lab with two independent reviewers perform blinded review of the MR scans. Nodes were assessed by both conventional review, uh, conventional radiology measures as well as size and morphology for changes in contrast intensity between pre-dose and post-dose MRI scans and for the discriminating factors of homogeneous versus heterogeneous hypo-intensity patterns. MRI-based assessments 
uh, of predose versus postdose, MS MSH2IA injection was possible in eight out of 13 patients. There were image artifacts or agent uptake issues in the other five patients. Radiologists' assessment indicated uptake of the drug by both normal and tumor-containing nodes. Um, uh, the uptake of the agent was, results in a uniform dark contrast uh, for uh, normal nodes. In tumor-containing nodes, uh, radiologists identified scattered regions of speckled appearance indicative of heterogeneous architecture with particular darkening in the nodes. MRI assessment of post-dose imaging performed similar to or better than standard of care axillary ultrasound imaging in all eight participants was safe and well tolerated in all 13. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brighton. Thank you for persisting in getting your uh, slides up here this morning. We're glad to see that. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit um, now and move from the investigational agents to approved agents and um, uh, approved methodology um, where we're looking at new, um, uh, new opportunities. Um, our first presentation will be by um, uh, Julia Matheson from the Royal Melbourne Hospital, University of Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia. Um, uh, outcomes of surveillance using contrast enhanced mammography in women with a personal history of breast cancer. Uh, Julia, thank you. Thank you. So I'll be discussing the use of contrast enhanced mammography, or CEM, for breast cancer surveillance. We know that women with a personal history of breast cancer have a high rate of subsequent breast malignancy. And this includes interval cancers, which have poorer prognostic factors and can account for about 30% of new cancers. Annual mammography plus or minus ultrasound has been standard surveillance for these women with previous breast cancer. Contrast enhanced mammography is an emerging imaging modality that is more sensitive than standard mammography and has specificity comparable to MRI, but its utility for surveillance has been uncertain. This is a retrospective study of 1,190 women with previous breast cancer having surveillance CEM. There were 3,782 episodes of surveillance, and 186 of these were recalled for further assessment, a recall rate of 4.9%. 71 of these were true positives, 50 cancers and 21 cases of DCIS, with a cancer detection rate of 18.7 per 1,000 screens. 48% of the true positives were only recalled due to the contrast component of the imaging. The PPV1 was 38%, but a number of uh, false positives could be identified with supplemental imaging. So the PPV3, the chance of a biopsied lesion being malignant, was 49%. And these images uh, speak to what we saw. So the top two panes show um, mammographic images in this woman that were identical to the surveillance uh, standard mammogram done one year prior. But in the, the lower two panes, you can see areas of non-mass enhancement that were invasive cancer with associated DCIS. An important consideration when introducing a more sensitive surveillance modality is the risk of overdiagnosis but our results were reassuring. 62% of um, lesions identified only due to the contrast component of the imaging were invasive cancers, and the majority of these were grade two or three, and a third were triple negative cancers. There was only a single case of low grade DCIS, or the others were grade two or three. The surveillance detected cancer rates differed by background parenchymal enhancement, they were higher for the almost 7% of women with moderate or marked BPE, and also by index cancer subtype, being highest for women with index triple negative cancers. Most pleasingly, the interval cancer rate was low. In our study period, there were only two symptomatic interval cancers, giving a rate of 0.8 per 1,000 screens. There were an additional two cancers that were identified on early imaging done for other reasons, for example, a patient going overseas. And again, these images show an area of non-mass enhancement, just anterior to a minimal size speculated mass that likely wouldn't have been seen without contrast, and this was multifocal grade three invasive cancer. So CEM surveillance led to increased detection of clinically significant lesions. There was a 1.92-fold increase in these with the use of contrast. 
The surveillance cancer detection rates differed by BPE and index cancer subtype. And most importantly, the interval cancer rate was far lower than seen in published series. So 0.8 per 1,000 screens compared to a very large cohort where it was 3.6 with standard mammography in women with a personal history of breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Very nicely presented. Uh, we're going to continue the theme of, of functional um, imaging, um, uh, that with contrast enhanced mammography. We'll move on to MRI. And our next talk will be presented by Maya Rausch, the University of Texas, MD Anderson. Um, early prediction of response to neoadjuvant immunotherapy in triple, triple negative breast cancer with DCMRI. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave, for introduction. It's my pleasure to present preliminary results of our research on behalf of a multidisciplinary team of Artemis 2.0 investigators who are all uh, listed on this introductory slide. I have no financial disclosures. So, motivation for our research was relatively recent approval of uh, immunotherapy, and particularly pembrolizumab, for neoadjuvant treatment of patients with trip negative breast cancer. While Keynote 522 clinical trial demonstrated that there is increased rate of pathologic complete response, at the same time, it is well known that it is associated with toxicity, some of which may be severe. Therefore, there is urgent need for development of non-invasive biomarkers of the response to immunochemotherapy for prediction of the response. And this is needed to guide patients to least toxic and most effective treatment regimens. Patients who are excellent responders, they can be de-escalated. Surgery can be brought up and performed at mid-treatment, skipping the second half of the surgery. While patients who are chemo-resistant, they can be switched to the novel clinical targeted trials who may be more effective. We evaluated the CMRI tumor volume changes measured early during neoadjuvant immunochemotherapy uh, for prediction of treatment response. How we did it? Tumor volume reduction was calculated uh, uh, in 62 uh, stage 1, 3, triple negative breast cancers based on the CMRI measurements at baseline after two and four cycles of the treatment and were correlated with results at surgery, PCR versus non-PCR. And these are figures for tumor volume and uh, tumor volume reduction. Hopefully you can see my arrow. These are patient characteristics. Okay, yeah, I just moved the arrow, thanks. Yeah, so these are our patient characteristics. Majority of patients were uh, invasive ductal cancers, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this given time limitations. 61 of our patients uh, achieved PCR. These are results of um, after two cycles of neoadjuvant immunochemotherapy. What we found that 86 of patients uh, who demonstrated tumor volume reduction 90% and above had PCR. While if there was tumor volume reduction 35% and below, then chemo resistance was predicted with negative predictive value 100%. How about after four cycles of immunotherapy? In these cases, 82% who had tumor volume reduction, 95% and above, had PCR, and tumor volume reduction, 75% and above, predicted chemo resistance with NPV of 100% and AUC of 0.81. Here are two examples on the top row patient uh, who had 91 and 98% tumor volume reduction after two and four cycles. This was predictive of PCR. And below is patient with 35 and 55% tumor volume reduction, which was predictive of non-PCR. And respectively, first patient had no residual disease, second patient had residual disease at surgery. In conclusion, 
Tumal volume reduction by the CMRI measured early during neoadjuvant immunochemotherapy was able to predict PCR status of trip negative breast cancer patients is either excellent responders or non responders. High accuracy of prediction was seen after four cycles of treatment with AUC 0.81, then after two cycles of neoadjuvant immunochemotherapy, and these preliminary results will be validated in the larger cohort after completion of the ongoing prospective clinical trial. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Maya. Um, in continuing the theme of MRI and neoadjuvant uh, uh, therapy, uh, the next presentation is uh, by Marin Andreasen from the Vestre Viken uh, from Asker, Norway. I hope I did that right, uh, um, uh, Marin. And she'll be talking about restriction spectrum imaging MRI uh, for automated evaluation of response to new adjuvant therapy in breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marin Andreasen, and I will be presenting this work from the University of California, San Diego, which is the initial look at restriction spectrum imaging MRI in the neoadjuvant breast cancer setting. The objective of this study was to investigate if automatic restriction spectrum imaging MRI, or RSI for short, can monitor breast tumor size during neoadjuvant therapy and the endpoint was non-pathological complete response. RSI is an MRI method where we're able to differentiate the restricted diffusion from cancer cells from that of normal tissue cells and extracellular water. This method was developed for other cancer types but is now being applied in the breast. There were 27 patients included in this new adjuvant study and they received MRI scans at four time points. At baseline, at the pretreatment time point, after three weeks of therapy at the early treatment time point, at a mid-treatment time point after 12 weeks, and post-therapy. And we uh, compared the automatically assessed tumor size by RSI to two main MRI methods. Uh, so we compared to standard dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, or DCE for short, where we manually assess the tumor size at each time point. And we also compared to the standard diffusion method, apparent diffusion coefficient, or ADC, where we um, took the mean value at each time point. The main finding of this study was that RSI was able to predict response to treatment after three weeks of therapy at the early treatment time point. And um, generally, we saw a trend of RSI uh, performing um, similarly to contrast-weighted MRI and contrast to ADC. Here we see an example case of a pathological complete responder at surgery. In the top row, we see RSI maps that captures the response of the tumor. Uh, the second row uh, are the contrast-weighted uh, imaging maps, and then the third bottom row are the ADC maps. So firstly, the novel RSI method was able to predict response to new advent therapy after only three weeks. RSI performed similarly to contrast-weighted MRI, avoiding the use of contrast agents. RSI automatically assessed tumor size without time-consuming radiologist input. The MRI RSI acquisition scan time is 4 minutes and 25 seconds, which is similar to most clinical diffusion sequences, which means avoiding additional scan time. So to conclude, RSI has a large potential to guide clinical decision making and enable tailored therapy regimens. However, this was a small study and had a small sample size. So large-scale validation studies in routine breast cancer follow-up are warranted. Thank you.
Thank you very, thank you very much, Marin. Um, we will now um, move to our last presentation, which is going to be presented by video, followed by a discussant. Um, with a few technical glitches and, um, and some change in order, we probably won't have a lot of time for questions, but there is an opportunity to put questions into the chat and have them answered that way as well. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and start our video for the last presentation, which moves us back to PET molecular imaging, and it's by Dr. Zheng from Chongqing, China. Um, Single-arm phase two study of fulvestrin combined with chemotherapy in the new adjuvant treatment of uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative locally advanced breast cancer. And we'll start the video. combined with chemotherapy in the neuroadjuvant treatment of HR positive and HER2 negative locally advanced breast cancer. It is well known that HR positive and HER2 negative breast cancer is less sensitive to neuroadjuvant chemotherapy. The objective of this study was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of adding for Western to neuroadjuvant chemotherapy. In patients with HR positive and HER2 negative locally advanced breast cancer. Additionally, the study aimed to investigate the association of PET, FES PET CT, and metabolize with efficacy. In this study, eligible patients were females with initially treated ER positive and HER2 negative LABC, stage 2B 23C. Patients received for Western plus AC follow T regimen followed by surgery. Premenopausal women were administered a concomitant GnRH analog. At phase nine, patients underwent FES PET CT and plasma samples were collected for LCMS analyze. 36 patients were enrolled. As for the primary endpoint, ORR was 86.1%. MP grade of 80.6% patients was equal or greater than 3. The most common treatment emergent adverse events were neutropenia and leukopenia. After the FES PET CT scan before initiating for Vestrin, the average SUV in primary breast nations was 4.17. It was significantly correlated with clinical efficacy and the changes in ER expression before and after treatment. Meanwhile, the SUV max of sensitive patients was significantly higher than that of long sensitive patients. A SUV max threshold of 4.6 may be indicative of a greater benefit for patients. Among these samples with metabolic analyze, 13 differential metabolites were identified between sensitive and non-sensitive patients, which were markedly enriched in 19 metabolic pathways. In conclusion, the addition of fulvestrin to neuroadjuvant chemotherapy showed manageable toxicity and promising anti-tumor activity for patients with HR positive and HER2 negative LABC. FES PET CT might serve as a tool to predict the effectiveness of neuroadjuvant combination therapy. Altered met metabolize or metabolic pathways might be associated with the response to this combined treatment approach. In the future, we will design randomized controlled trial. We'll, we'll thank the speaker uh, for that video. Um, and so, um, a great uh, session. We'll move on to the discussant again. Just as a reminder, in the first session, those were all investigational agents. Here, the contrast agents given are all uh, approved, actually. Some of these are novel applications. So um, to, to sum up what you've just heard over the last four presentations, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Amy Fowler from the University of Wisconsin, an expert not only in molecular imaging, but also breast imaging and the topics that we've seen today. And Amy, thank you for doing this. And could we bring up Amy's slides, please? Anybody got a good joke while we're waiting for the slides uh, <laughs> to come along? Um, I will remind you, um, 
we probably will have time for one or two questions. There are questions coming up in the chat. I'm trying to answer some of the ones I can. And then we'll also encourage people to seek out the speaker since we may not have time. Uh, there we go. Amy, it's all yours. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, to wrap things up, it's my pleasure um, to uh, focus on these last four presentations, which were awesome. So um, let's see here. So as you heard already, you know, the overarching theme from this last um, set of um, abstracts, we're focused um, primarily on, uh, on two questions, and one being how imaging can play a role during neoadjuvant therapy, and more specifically, um, pre-therapy imaging, uh, and imaging early during therapy uh, for predicting uh, pathologic response and patient outcomes. And then also, further down the line after treatment and um, looking in the surveillance setting, what imaging and functional imaging can be used um, to be the most sensitive to detect recurrence and second primaries in patients with a personal history of treated breast cancer. So focusing on uh, Dr. Zhang's uh, video presentation, uh, for this study I just wanted to highlight a few things of why this is an a, a important and novel question. Uh, the focus here was on neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, and what was novel about that is that the agent used was fulvestrant instead of typically what is seen in the neoadjuvant endocrine setting, which is aromatase inhibitors, and also the combination of fulvestrant together with standard of care chemotherapy. And then also uh, unique to the study uh, was the exploration of uh, a new imaging biomarker, a newly approved, uh, relatively newly approved uh, imaging biomarker, FES, in the neoadjuvant setting. Importantly, this has been used in the metastatic setting predominantly, and you heard a nice introduction in, uh, to FES by Dr. Dadashti. Um, and then lastly, incorporating liquid biopsy biomarkers in the neoadjuvant setting and looking at plasma metabolomics. And just to highlight a few of the uh, main uh, results that this combination uh, therapy, uh, endocrine and chemotherapy, um, was manageable toxicities, promising anti-tumor activity, and that the imaging part of this, the FES SUV max, correlated with clinical efficacy and was a higher SUV max for those individuals who were responders. And that the investigators identified 19 metabolic pathways that were enriched um, based on pathologic response. So in terms of potential impact, this offers a potentially new approach for combination neoadjuvant th uh, therapy that's combining endocrine therapy with chemotherapy for patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative locally advanced breast cancer. Importantly, this adds evidence to uh, the appropriate use criteria for FES PET imaging, um, which currently for the neoadjuvant setting, the um, uh, appropriateness criteria was ranked as rarely appropriate, primarily due to lack of evidence. So this um, adds to at least one other um, published study in the neoadjuvant setting. And then lastly, important that this generates hypotheses for new imaging and or therapy approaches based on the metabolic pathways that were identified. So moving on to um, Dr. Rausch's presentation, focusing now uh, on MRI in the neoadjuvant setting. This was unique in that it um, was part of the Artemis study, um, focused on a newly approved therapy in the neoadjuvant setting, specifically immunotherapy, uh, again for the subset of patients with early stage triple negative breast cancer that are high risk for recurrence. And this again is in combination with standard of care chemotherapy. And really again focusing on how um, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI um, may be helpful for predicting early response to neoadjuvant um, combination immuno and chemotherapy. And we currently have you know, very limited data in this in this area. Um, again, their main uh, results had shown that dynamic contrast enhanced MRI volumetric changes um, occurred uh, during therapy and predicted pathologic complete response and that higher accuracy was seen after four cycles of um, neoadjuvant therapy. Um, potential impact here, um, importantly, this is dynamic contrast enhanced MRI is what we typically do as standard of care and, and we don't typically use that in the early uh, neoadjuvant setting, but this is a data that could help support um, optimizing treatment for patients with triple negative breast cancer, importantly identifying those patients who have uh, who will be excellent responders so that you could potentially de-escalate therapy and prevent potential additional toxicities, um, or for patients who are non-responders, the potential for other targeted therapies or uh, in the neoadjuvant setting, again, going directly to surgery. 
Um, switching gears to uh, Dr. Andreasen's uh, presentation, um, this focused on uh, an aspect of um, breast MRI uh, that uses a new type of diffusion uh, weighted sequences, so restriction spectrum imaging. Again, looking at response to neoadjuvant therapy. And again, our current standard of therapy is, is the dynamic contrast enhancement and the potential advantages of this new technique with RSI is that you do not need gadolinium-based contrast agents, so may be appropriate for those patients you know, who are, are not able to get gadolinium. And the automated component of this um, may provide more reliable measurements. Uh, again, in this study, um, they had seen that RSI predicted therapy response after early, so after 19 days, um, and that uh, their performance was similar to DCE MRI, uh, which had manual tumor measurements. Uh, again, potential impact here is that the RSI method is automated and does not require contrast, so again, could be an option for patients unable to undergo um, dynamic contrast MRI. Measures changes in microscopic water diffuse, uh, diffusivity early during therapy, and again, that same idea of optimizing treatment to avoid additional toxicities for um, those who are excellent responders and getting those patients directly to surgery or offering new therapies that are non-responders. Um, again, uh, Dr. Matheson's uh, switching gears here now focused on contrast enhanced mammography and the setting of um, not, uh, no longer neoadjuvant, so now we're past treatment uh, and looking in the surveillance setting. And so this was a, a nice retrospective study uh, um, looking at what's the best, you know, whether this adds to current standard of care uh, imaging for patients who have a personal history of treated breast cancer, which is annual mammography, as indicated by the NCCN and ACR criteria. Um, the ACR criteria do add the potential for supplemental MRI uh, in those with dense breasts who are diagnosed young and have a higher lifetime risk, again, identifying that um, standard mammography may be limited in these, in these settings. And importantly, uh, this uh, abstract showed that contrast-enhanced mammography has potential increased sensitivity and a lower interval cancer rate compared to mammography alone for surveillance, in, for surveillance imaging for women with a personal history of breast cancer. And this could be a potential option, again, for patients who are unable to, to undergo screening um, breast MRI with contrast-enhanced, uh, or dynamic contrast-enhanced breast MRI. And um, I think this would also be a potential, potential approach that is more accessible, more widely available to patients, and could be preferred over um, breast MRI, even in patients who can get breast MRI. And this is just highlighting a study recently published by Dr. Berg um, that was a survey um, that patients had tended to, who had both contrast-enhanced mammography and breast MRI, did tend to prefer contrast-enhanced mammography. Um, so I think we'll wrap up there. And it's just been a pleasure to, uh, to share these results with you today and, and uh, so a discuss, discuss them. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Amy, for a very nice overview. Uh, Farouk, we'll probably invite you back up in case we have any questions. For the first session presenters, we didn't quite have enough chairs up here, so if a question comes up, uh, let us know. Um, first of all, I want to thank the speakers for doing fabulous presentations, very exciting session, keeping on time, um, which was great, and um, to the discussions for these insightful uh, talks. Um, we are within about two to three minutes of the end of this, and I think we have time for some questions, and I'll ask one of the questions that come up in the chat. Um, please come up to the microphone also if you have questions, and again, I'll encourage you to continue to look at the posters. Probably stay here for a few minutes until we get kicked out so we can have some Q&A. Um, one question came up, and I believe um, this is for Julia. Um, did you have any trouble with the contrast enhancement identifying those lesions to biopsy? Say, for example, they only showed up in the contrast enhancement. And we, I think those things work, so try pressing them and see how they go. Yes, um, so the question was, um, did you have any problem identifying sites to biopsy when you saw them by contrast enhancement? So we use three, three main modalities for the biopsies. So if they could be identified without contrast stereotactic, um, but, uh, but otherwise usually did an ultrasound first to see if they were identifiable with ultrasound, but a number of the contrast only lesions did need MRI biopsy. So it was important um, that our institution had excellent experience with MR and MR biopsy. Contrast enhanced biopsy wasn't available in Australia at the time of our study. Thank you. And, and there's a follow-up question um, that was, this was just standard 
standard ionated contrast. There's yeah, that's right. It. it was omnipaque. So the only difference really to the standard mammogram was the patients had an IV line inserted and then a dose of omnipaque. So it was quite easy to institute into the, the normal flow of the mammographic service. Great. So to my left, a question. Please identify yourself and give us a question. On the Chicago University of Pittsburgh. My question's for me. Could I, could I ask you, if you don't mind just taking your mask off so we can hear it, it's hard to understand. We, we won't let anybody get too close to you, I promise. Bob Nishikawa, University of Pittsburgh. Questions for Mia. So what fraction of patients fell between the 75 and 95 percent thresholds? Sorry, I'm having difficulty. Yeah, I think we're having audio problems. It's hard for us to, to, to hear that, yeah. I'll ask it afterwards. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Or if you want to come up closer to us, then I can repeat the question. For some reason, there's a big echo up here. Um, other questions? So I want to ask our two um, uh, discussants, and other folks can chime in. C could, you, um, could each of you perhaps identify where you think of the things that you've seen um, were really near-term implications that could happen in the clinic? So, so Farouk, for you, you have investigational agents. Do you see any of those agents having near-term uh, clinical translation and impact? Sorry. Okay. Um, Dave, I couldn't hear it very well, uh, but I think you're asking me if these biomarkers um, can have an effect in, um, in the future in the clinic. I think I, I'd like to go back to uh, our great example of FES that um, we see it in clinic, how important it is and how it can change uh, patient management. And I think these other tracers, the biomarkers that uh, discussed today, um, they have all the potential to be as effective uh, or maybe even more effective than FES, and we just have to study them a little more and, um, and hopefully we can get them FDA approved and combine them with the in vitro um, assays um, and evaluation of the tumor tissue um, and the combination, I think, it does really better um, than just using uh, one biomarker, whether it is tumor tissue analysis or imaging by itself. And I'll, I'll come a little closer so there's not as much an echo because people may be able to hear me. And if for you, Amy, the, the presentations you have are actually all things that can be done in the clinic now. What do you see as one or two of them that might be part of practice even, even as we speak? Yeah, so um, definitely breast MRI has been around a while. Um, I think the main thing is, um, you know, the novelty being, you know, using it in an early, that early time point. And, and when that early time point is defined, it's a little bit variable. But um, typically what is seen, um, you, you know, patients don't get imaging during the course of neoadjuvant therapy unless there's concern on physical, you know, followed by physical exam, and if there's concern for progression, is when patients typically either go to mammogram and ultrasound at that point. So I think there's a, a real underutilization of um, standard standard of care dynamic contrast enhanced breast MRI during that period, which, you know, whether that's insurance related or just um, you know further evidence showing you know that stand, that neoadjuvant therapy would change during the course of treatment. Um, and then I think contrast enhanced mammo is really just exploding and has really picked up recently and is very um, easy for breast imaging clinics to incorporate and definitely has the advantage of, um, of increased uh, sensitivity for, uh, over non-contrast. Right. We have time for one more question. We have a huge echo problem. If you could come up and, and just say it to us, I'll repeat it, okay? Because we can't hear it from the microphone, sorry.
So I'm going to repeat that from some people that might have heard it, and I might not get it right. So I think this relates to our immunotherapy um, protocol. Um, but in general, one is, is we're going to these fancier dev devices, PET and MRI, um, and approaches to predict response. How do we know how these measures compare to more conventional things such as mammography and ultrasound for size-based estimates of prediction of response? And then I'll come back to the second part of that, Maya, which was what do we do when PCR may still um, be guided by further therapy as it is in immunotherapy where giving prembolizumab still has results even if the person's not had a complete response. So let me start by um, maybe putting this to, to you, Maya, as you represent many of these modalities. What do you see as the advantage or performance of these new modalities versus the old ones? So. This is actually excellent question. Because again, uh, evaluation of response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, currently there is no standard. And that's the big problem, you know? And we do have, especially, you know, when you ask me, I come from UTMD Anderson, where we use ultrasound routinely, and we are so good on ultrasound, and we are capable of definitely doing excellent ultrasound, and we, like in part of the, our Artemis trial, actually used ultrasound for prediction of uh, differentiation of responders versus non-responders, and for the triaging them to the um, you know, targeted clinical trials. We actually also published paper based on ultrasound for prediction of excellent responders for the standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy in patients with triple negative breast cancer, which had PPV up to 80%. So ultrasound enhanced very highly skilled hands can be helpful. However, ultrasound main uh, problem is uh, reproducibility, reproducibility along other institutions and reproducibility, and it's because it's very skill dependent. And that what we found when we do ultrasound, we get this excellent result, but when patient comes from other institutions, we practically have to redo the ultrasound on our own and do our own evaluations. So yes, ultrasound is good, however, if you want it to be universally accepted because of the, such a high dependence on the skill, it is really very difficult. It's, it's too much of inter-observer inter variance to make it the tool, and this is the reason why we don't have ultrasound and resist criteria, because it's too inter-observer, the, uh, the significant difference. So that answers your question about ultrasound. Yeah, and I'll, we'll probably, I'm, I'll quickly go to the second question as a discussion maybe among folks is, when PCR may or may not be the endpoint that it is, that it, it, it has been with something like immunotherapy, um, I think that's a larger discussion about what endpoints are. And, and as we should all be doing beyond PCR, we should be looking for overall survival, re relapse-free survival in the setting, and I think that was a good point. I want to close by giving my own personal answer to that, is um, these techniques that we're looking at here versus traditional techniques that are more size-based, what's the comparison? And I would say you're looking for different things. If you're trying to identify residual tumor at the end of treatment, there are other methods that will work well, as will these. I think what you're hearing here is that early assessments early on, relatively soon after therapy, within a week or two, um, can have the ability to identify who's not responding. And so it's a different question. You really want to identify, I think, up front, if you've got a regimen that is not good enough to achieve the endpoint that you want. And we're beginning to see this in a number of spaces. There's the Fergain study looking at FDG PET for HER2. There's about to be a trial opening um, called the direct trial with an ECOG Akron assessing these ideas, where if you know you're not going to respond sufficiently, perhaps you change the therapy and as a way of using these techniques, not so much for predicting who has a complete response at the very end of therapy, but predicting who's not going to get there with reasonable negative predictive value. Um, so with that, taking the moderator's prerogative to jump into that, I again want to thank the speakers and the discussants um, uh, for a great uh, session. I, I hope this is part of a new tradition at San Antonio that we will continue to bring these novel approaches for detection, response, and tissue characterization here. And um, I encourage you to go enjoy the posters um, and some of the food and coffee that may still be outside. Thank you.